Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pantheon Resources webinar for our technical update. Before we get into it, I apologize for the technical issues we had yesterday, and we simply made a very difficult decision because this technical update is really a resource document that we couldn't do it unless we were fully satisfied that all of the tools at our disposal were working. So we made that difficult decision to delay by one day. So thank you all for joining today. Good afternoon to those of you in Europe. Good morning to those of you in North America. And good evening or good night to those of you in Asia. You don't need to see me at all. I'm Jay Cheatham. I'm the CEO of Pantheon. I'm going to turn off my camera before I introduce everybody. So on today's webinar, myself, Bob Rosenthal, our technical director, Justin Hondras, our finance director, and then we truly have an all-star lineup. From ESIZE, Roger Young, Chief Te Technical Officer, and Dan Hughes, to go through their seismic petrophysics. From AHS Baker Hughes, Mike Smith, the president and founder, to go through his volatiles analysis. Ed Duncan, a geologic consultant to Pantheon, who will take you through a brief regional geology of the area and why Theta West project is truly unique. Jerry Nichols, another consulting geologist for us, will do the volumetrics and then a 3D video of the subsurface. And if you're like me, I'm a visual learner, and that is just really fun to see. Finally, I'll, I'll wrap up with project economics after Jerry does his volumetrics. So to set the stage for the people that are new to our story, this is a map of the Alaskan North Slope. To the north is the Arctic Sea. Why are we in, in the North Slope? The simple answer is it's where the oil is. There are giant multi-billion barrel oil fields here, anchored by Prudhoe Bay discovered in the late 60s. When Prudhoe Bay was originally discovered, it had an estimated 10 billion barrels of oil in place and 3 billion barrels recoverable done by de Gaulle McNaughton. Today, Prudhoe Bay is 33 billion barrels of oil in place and will recover more than 16 billion barrels. It will recover more than the original estimate of the oil in place. It's simply an indication that good, big oil fields get bigger and better. And we'll show that to you on our acreage as well. To the west of Prudhoe Bay is Kapark. It is more than doubled in size now to 7 billion barrels. Going further to the west is the Alpine field. Now, Alpine was discovered by Roger Young and Dan Hughes when they were at Union Texas Petroleum. It has more than doubled in size. It's on its way to over 1.2 billion barrels recoverable. Why else are we in Alaska? It is a stable economic in environment. We have very, very low royalties on our acreage. It's outlined there in gray, about a 15% average royalty. We have one royalty owner, the state of Alaska. It is basically an underexplored basin. Now, normally, you need several hundred million barrels to be economic on the North Slope. But you will hear this over and over today. Because of our location, we can make accumulations much smaller than that economic, and they are. We have about 160,000 acres. We have high graded this acreage from a much, much larger acreage position. The area to the west of our two units, 
that's outlined as theta west, we have nine and 10 year tenure. And on our units, Alcade and Talitha, we have permanent tenure as long as we are carrying out the scheduled work program through the state. It's all 100% working interest acreage. We can do two of these developments from the Dalton Highway. And the Dalton Highway is simply the feeder road that delivers material to the North Slope. Now, two weeks ago, I was driving the Dalton Highway. I drove the Dalton Highway from Fairbanks to Dead Horse, camped out, spent three days. It was glorious. It was fun to drive along the Dalton Highway and see the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, which runs right along the Dalton Highway. It was like a Tinker Toy set sitting out there. So we can do two developments from the Dalton Highway, Alcade and part of Talitha. Now, because of its location, Alcade, our smallest of our projects, and something that's 100 million barrels or slightly smaller, we can develop it. We can do it year round from gravel pads set along the Dalton Highway and have high net present value per barrel. It is because of the location. We are not saddled with the long distances and other environmental issues that can happen when you're further away from the main infrastructure of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline and the Dalton Highway. Now, our three projects combined, Alcade, the Talitha Shelf Margin Delta, and Theta West have a combined 1.9 billion barrels of contingent resource. Now, by comparison, in 2017, when all prices were lower, oil search paid $3.10 a barrel for contingent resource barrel on their Pika Horseshoe development to just to enter that development. And you can see where it's located, much further away from the infrastructure. By comparison, at today's market cap for Pantheon, we are below 30 cents a barrel per contingent resource barrel. Now, finally, the management team. We all have deep experience deep experience overall and deep experience in Alaska. We plan to prove up and sell this asset. For many on our team, this is our last endeavor and we plan to exit with a big win. Now, I mentioned how do, how do big oil fields get bigger and better? Well, you get bolt on fields. But also, we have 16 billion barrels oil in place from the three projects I mentioned, Alcade, the Talitha Shelf Margin Delta, and Theta West. At our recovery factor of around 1.9 billion barrels, we're in the low teens on recoveries. What if we improve that by from low teens to the mid-20s? We double that resource or that reserve. Also, not included, the shelf margin delta A and C, the slope fan, and the Capard. So, next slide, please, Justin. What are the key points? As I mentioned, 1.9 billion barrels contingent resource recoverable, growth potential, and I didn't mention the number, but about 200 million barrels is accessible from the Dalton Highway. This presentation, highly technical, is a distillation of thousands of hours of technical analysis. All of the work that you'll see here and the drilling that we've done has reduced greatly the development risk. And we have 100% working interest in these projects. In red, that's a quote from IHS Market. I don't need to read it to you, but it is about the Talitha A well. So just to recap the webinar agenda, I've just done the introduction 
Roger's going to do the Talitha A update. Mike Smith's going to do the volatiles analysis, then Ed Duncan, then back to Roger and, and Jerry for the uh, volumetrics and the, on all of our fields. I'll do the development economics. And finally, we'll do the video presentation and have our Q&A. So before we get into it, we've got two slides to show you just an outline of what we learned from the Talitha A. So this, this is the outline of our units. You can see in light blue the Theta West outline. That will be discussed today. Next slide, please, Justin. And that is an outline of the shelf margin delta B. That's the change from what we've learned with Talitha A. And now I turn it over to Roger. Great. Thank you, Jay. Uh, we're going to get into the log analysis. And what I want to share with you is log analysis is an interpretive process. It's interpretive because we don't measure how much oil there is with logs. What we measure are things like how fast does sound go through the rock? What's the, uh, what does the rock do to gamma rays? How does the rock interact with neutrons? What's the conductivity of electricity in the rock? Obviously, none of these things are things we really want to know. We want to know how much oil there is. So we integrate all this information or invert all this information to try to sort out how much oil we have. As you can see, there's room for error, or room for uh, interpretive uh, biases. So what we do is we take rotary sidewall cores. And in this well, we took 100 rotary sidewall cores throughout the whole section of rock that you see there on the left. This allows us to ground truth the log analysis so we can really get a comfortable answer on what's going on. Because this is such a long, over half a mile of gross reservoir rock, I'm putting the on the left side the log analysis of the whole section just so you have some perspective of where we are. We're going to start at the bottom at the Kapark. The first thing we're going to look at is the lithology results from the log analysis. Shale is green, sand is yellow, this, this green here is oil, and these are heavy minerals. Now in the next track, what you're seeing is the amount of oil in green, but you're also seeing a lot of dots. Each of those dots are core points. So as you can see, we've got quite a few core points just in the Kapark and the, in the HRZ above it. And what we're measuring in that track is the porosity of the core measured compared to the porosity of the log analysis. And as you can see, there's a very strong relationship between the two. When we go to the next track, what we're looking at is the water saturation. So this zone here, where the Kaparic is, that's the most interesting zone. And you can see that the water saturations from the core highly match the core saturations from the log analysis. The following track is the, uh, is the mobility that we see from the core. When it's green, we're seeing oil that has moved through the rock. When it's black, like up in the HRZ, which is a source rock, that oil is not movable. And then the final track that's interesting is this, that's the permeability track. So you can see that there's a nice relationship between the permeability and what we calculated from the core. So overall, what we see in the Kapark is it's filled with oil, both from the rocks, from the permeability, we have movable oil. The Kapark is, uh, is, is a good reservoir and you're gonna see from Mike Smith afterwards, that his analysis also shows the Kapark to be a, a very good reservoir. I'm gonna move up pole now, and we'll go to the basin floor fan, or the Theta West rock. What we're looking at here is over 600 feet of rock that's filled with oil. You can see the great relationships between all the core points and the log analysis porosity. And you can also see that I am still being very conservative about the, that correlation. I can very easily scoot everything to the left, make things a little bit more porous than they actually than I actually have currently. But I'd rather be conservative than overly optimistic. 
in the water saturation track, you see a very nice correlation between the core points and the water saturation, and also notice how movable that oil is through that whole entire section. We'll move up now to the basin floor, the upper basin floor fan. So there's the hue shale between these two fans. And then the upper basin floor fan is in a very distal position. But nevertheless, even though it's so distal from where we think the reservoir is really good, it's still filled with oil. And it matches that the logs and the core match. Move up further to the, to the slope fan. These aren't even included. The up basin floor, upper basin floor fans or slope fans, these aren't even included in the contingent resources that we're showing you today. But as you can see, there's still a lot of prospectivity here with lots of movable oil. Now up to the shelf margin deltaic. In the deltaic, we have three lobes, the A, the B, and the C. What we're going to be concentrating today is on the B section, the one in the middle. But overall, what you see is, again, good tie between the log analysis and the core. So now what I want to do is pass it off to Mike Smith, and you can see how his work in the volatiles world matches what I've showed you here today. Hi, I'm Mike Smith. I'm president of Advanced Hydrocarbon Stratigraphy, and I'm here to talk to you about the volatile analysis services that we performed on the Pantheon Talitha A well in the North Slope of Alaska. Uh, this is some of my, my previous history. I've been working on analyzing volatiles and cuttings for about 40 years now. I invented the first mass spec system that analyzed individual fluid inclusions back in the 1980s. Uh, from there, I went to Amica Research, where I invented fluid inclusion stratigraphy, which was recently purchased by Schlumberger and uh, won me a very prestigious award at Amico. I left Amico uh, and founded AHS in uh, 1994 and invented a new technology called fluid inclusion volatiles. After just five years in 1999, ExxonMobil purchased fluid inclusion volatiles from me and, and and the lab is still uh, in use, in large use, and used worldwide by ExxonMobil that considers it a strategic asset. Uh, after my 10 years of consulting with Exxon, I refounded AHS and worked on a new technology we're calling Volatile Analysis Services, or VAS. And this technology differs from the previous two in that we are now looking at present day fluids, formation fluids, oil, gas, and water, trapped in very, very, very tiny spaces and cuttings, uh, drill cuttings, which are the rocks brought up by the drill bit. And this tells us about the present day distribution of fluids in the subsurface, as opposed to fluid inclusions, which were our information about the past. Uh, we've been in a strategic partnership with Baker Use since about 2018, and they market our technology worldwide. This is a list of some of my patents just to demonstrate my bona fides in the, in the field. Uh, there are three systems in the world that uh, are really produce the bulk or all of the volatile information on cuttings. There's the fluid inclusion stratigraphy system at Schlumberger. There's the fluid inclusion volatile system at ExxonMobil. And there's our system. Uh, so if, if you're working on volatiles in cuttings, um, you're almost certainly working with the machine that I invented and designed and, and built. We have a philosophy at AHS of, of unbiased science. We, we ask our clients not to provide us with any information on their well or their prospect uh, before we do our work. And this was the case with, with Pantheon Great Bear. Uh, we had no information or from any of their results on these wells while we were analyzing their cuttings and not until we had our final data, data drop off and, and long discussions with with the Pantheon scientists as to what the information mean did, did they turn around and inform us of anything. So this, this study that we're going to show was then completely bind by AHS with no information from Pantheon. This is a slide showing some of the results. So these are, uh, we worked on cutting, two types of cuttings for this well. We worked on what we call sealed at the well cuttings, which are caught 
uh, right when the cuttings come to the surface and within a minute of being at the surface are sealed in our, our tubes that we provide to the well. And then they're shipped back to the lab to be analyzed. The other kind of cuttings we look at are um, ones that we load in the lab. So the cuttings are just caught at the well site and then washed and dried and, and brought back to the lab and we analyze those as well. So we, we get a little bit different information for both types of cuttings. If you look at the left curve here, the it looks mostly solid green and, and above it is, is blank white. And on the left of that are some red, small red bars which show where we had samples. And you can see we have solid green for, for most of the wells, about 3,700 feet of well there that's showing green and that's like 416 or some odd cutting samples and, and what this tells us is that every cutting sample in this well from the top of that green bar to, to total depth on the well contained oil so there was live oil in all those samples at the top of that sample is a regional seal and what we see above that is we see that almost all the samples we analyzed above the regional seal except for one do not contain oil. So we have a continuous column of oil in cuttings from the, the base of the regional seal to TD in the well. Every, every cutting uh, we analyze contained oil for 3,700 feet. This is a, a quite unusual uh, occurrence and really speaks to the great uh, strength and of the petroleum system here where this well is drilled. This is really a world-class petroleum system. The second curve from the left is, is kind of green and yellow shaded, uh, somewhat irregular in character. That's telling us about the reservoir quality, and that's from comparing the sealed at well samples with the lab loaded samples. And so by making that comparison, we can document where the good reservoir are in this well. And there's quite a bit of good reservoir in this well. Up and down, up and down the section, uh, we see good reservoir. Now the the length of that column is that's the length of the number of samples that we had that were sealed at the well. Uh, so below that, there's no data because there were no sealed at the well samples. But for the most part, what we're seeing is great reservoir up and down the well. The other thing of interest is um, if we jump over to the right, the second curve from the right, which is orange in color, is our estimate of the oil quality that we see in the cutting. So for most of the cuttings, what we're seeing is that the oil quality is very good, very high oil quality, somewhere between mid 30s API gravity to low 40s API gravity, which is is pretty much the best oil quality you can get. Uh, you know, it's 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 really really good oil quality. The other thing we have besides the cuttings to work with are the sidewall cores. So the sidewall cores were taken in this well. Um, there's a little tool that'll go up and down the borehole after the well is drilled. That's like a, a, a little drill bit, but it's hollow and it'll it'll cut a core out of the out of the side of the well, such the name so the name sidewall core. So we had Pantheon uh, really did a great job on taking uh, quite a few sidewall cores in this well. It's it's excellent data, and we were able to analyze small bits of those. We don't use very much data. And to the left then is our cuttings data and to the right is our sidewall core data. So now let's look at some of these sidewall core data in detail. On, on the left we have a pink curve which is CO2 and CO2 is very useful for us in determining subsurface pressures. The main driver of increased CO2 in cuttings is, is increased pressure in the subsurface. So you see at the bottom we have high pressure a thin zone of high pressure, and this is in the pebble shale. It's also a zone of high water content. Um, as we look, th look through the data, what we see is that many zones are showing low water content. So our lab is one of, is the only lab in the world right now that's able to provide meaningful uh, water <clears throat> formation, water information on drill cuttings. And this has taken many, many years to develop, but we finally cracked that nut. And what we can see is that up and down the borehole, both in the cuttings and in the sidewall cores, we see many areas of, of low water content indicating uh, high oil content. So there's only three types of fluids in the subsurface, oil, water, and gas. <clears throat> if your water is low, it means that the rest of the pore space is being filled by petroleum. And this is looking at the data 
<clears throat> scaled the same for the cuttings and the sidewall course scaled the same as as far as depth goes and you can see again that uh, many places we have low water content here and, and those are areas where we we think that the well uh, is going to be particularly perspective and overall um, we have <clears throat> this very large column of cuttings that all contain live oil 3700 feet of column cuttings with each one having live oil in it we have good reservoir quality we have low water contents in many of those reservoirs indicating that they're charged with petroleum and we have good quality oil as <clears throat> shown by that orange curve over towards the right so with that I'd just like to conclude saying again that um, we have all these samples below the regional seal 416 cutting samples plus all the sidewall core samples that we analyzed <clears throat> all contain um, good quality light oil in the range of uh, the mid 30s to the low 40 api gravity we're seeing um, multiple pay zones throughout the section drilled including the caparic uh, the theta west and in the shelf margin deltaic and really important even though our analysis were done blind and without any information uh, provided by pantheon um, our conclusions line up very well with pantheon's petrophysical analysis of this well and, and both were done totally independent of one another so that i like to say thank you very much and, and pass it off to the next speaker thank you mike my name is ed duncan I'll be talking to you today about the Theta West fan. The Theta West fan complex is our largest new play in the portfolio. It's truly unique. The physical scale of the fan is amazing. It is the, the largest new play on the North Slope and we control it. I think it's important to recognize that the, because we invested the time in shooting and acquiring 3D across this vast area, it's allowing us to see things now with calibration from our own wells that heretofore have never been seen before. The focus continuity of this fan is truly impressive. Over 100,000 acres of our leasehold focused by our 3D and the technology that we use to analyze the 3D and tie it and calibrate it to the wells that we have drilled are allowing us to see light oil in reservoir. The thing about the Theta West fan that is so impressive, the size of the area that has these attributes that are clearly indicating that this is a play that is charged with light oil over a vast area. That's very different than the other new plays that you've heard about on the North Slope. We, this is not a widely distributed series of individual pools like you have in the in the Natashuk, scattered over thousands and thousands of square kilometers. This is a, a focused geologic system with reservoir that is charged with light oil. The fan itself is deposited directly on top of the HRZ oil source rock in the basin, directly on top of the HRZ oil source rock in its peak generating fairway. We know this because we've done the work. I think it's important to realize now that we have captured this new play systematically since 2019 in our leasing. We're not playing from behind on this. Let's look at the let's look at the next slide and talk a bit more in detail about the fan. Let's take a look at the details of the Theta West fan. We have a penetration now of Theta West with the Talitha well. You can see the entirety of our multiple zones of interest on the left hand side, everything from the top seal down through to the Kaparic. Remembering this entire section is charged with light oil, as Mike Smith has just explained. The interval that is, is Theta West is so shown here, labeled BFF, that's basin floor fan. It's an extraordinary section, 600 feet thick, extremely high net to growth, probably 50%, maybe a bit higher, maybe 60% sandstone in this interval. 
extraordinary. It's campaigning in age. Why is that important? Campanian sandstones are different from many of the other sandstones seen in this basin in this general times section. The Campanian and the Albion, Nanashuk, are very, very similar mineralogically. High quartz rich sandstones, very low volcanic clastics, well sorted, texturally mature, fairly coarse grained, fine to medium grain sandstone. That's a really big positive for us. What's amazing about Theta West, as we see it recorded in this log, is each depositional cycle is showing a constructional phase, a, an upbuilding aggradational phase, and an abandonment phase. So we have this cyclic system deposited in the basin floor across a vast area. As we've already talked about, this huge area of, of continuity that has reflection character, seismic attribute character, telling us that we've got a light oil charge through this section. Well, we've got a penetration at Talitha that tells us there's light oil charge throughout this section. It's an extraordinary occurrence for us. And we know, based on uh, regional models, that we're going to see uh, 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 variations in reservoir quality through here. Each cycle is going to have channels. It's going to have overbank facies. There's going to be levees. There's going to be some channel lobe complexes. There's going to be all kinds of, of assemblages of depositional facies that are our reservoirs in this fan system. It's going to be an extraordinary thing to drill and develop. Let's spend a bit more time looking at an analog. Tarn is a good working analog for us. It's an oil field on the north slope just a few tens of kilometers to the northwest of Theta West. It's in an older uh, stratigraphic section, but from a, from a depositional system in a facies architecture perspective, reservoir architecture perspective, I think it's a good analog. About 150 million barrel oil field, 130 million of which has been produced to date. It was discovered in the early 1990s, and uh, it, it's, a, it's a good working model for us to look at. It's much, much smaller, though. And Tarn's about 25 square kilometers. Uh, Theta West Fan, uh, the focused continuity portion of the Theta West Fan that we have leased is, is about 100,000 acres or about 500, close to 500 square kilometers. So uh, it's, it, 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 it's, it's a good analog, but a small analog. The thickest reservoirs uh, in, in, in this type of depositional system are in the inner fan lobes. Uh, channelized systems, channel lobe complexes. We get into thinner reservoirs, more thinly bedded reservoirs. We get into the inner channel areas and the, and the outer uh, fan portion. All of these facies, though, contribute. All of these facies have been drilled and recorded in Tarn. They all make a contribution to the production, and we expect nothing uh, less than that uh, when when Theta West is is under full development. Let's step on. Look at some seismic data because this is really what drives our our ability to to capture value for the company, uh, the, the 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 massive investment that's been made in 3D and the technology that's been built around that 3D, the analytical geophysics and so forth. But the the raw seismic is is really quite fun to look at for for folks like me who are seismic stratigraphers. Um, let's look at the Theta West fan complex, which is lying in here. All right. There are a number of horizons that have been interpreted here that, that will help guide our discussion. The green surface is the onset unconformity of the Theta West fan. It actually uh, shows a truncation of the underlying margin, the onlap of the fan back to the west, which is fundamental to the, to the trap geometry of the fan. The yellow surface is an intermediate uh, seal, a very important seal uh, to the lower fan lobe and the upper lobe seen here has uh, the upper surface and top seal as uh, shown in, in orange. All of these zones show uh, seismic reflection geometry and attributes that support our interests and drove our leasing. At Talitha, we drilled 600 feet, as we've already talked about, a very high net to growth section. Campanian age sandstones, probably 50 to 60% sandstone in this interval. That section, that interval in the lower lobe, 
thickens to the west, doubles in thickness, more than doubles in thickness, 1,300 feet in this location. It also is substantially shallower, up dip, right? We cut the top of the lower lobe at 9,200 feet here. We're going to cut the top of the lower lobe at the appraisal well location at about 7,000 feet. The upper lobe we drilled into at about 6,000 feet. That change in depth manifests itself in a number of ways. Importantly, it's a lot less expensive to drill, but also the change in depth means lower depth of burial. And that manifests itself as better reservoir quality, less compaction. All right, so that's an important concept uh, to, to, to apply across the North Slope, not just to our project, but across the North Slope. Depth of burial is important. It's, it's important for cost. It's also important for reservoir character and, and porosity and permeability. But this is an extraordinary occurrence, folks. Uh, a, a, an absolute huge basin floor fan that we have captured, we have covered with our 3D, and we have captured with our leasing. I'm an exploration geologist, a petroleum systems guy. I hesitate to say expert, but let's let's petroleum systems guy. I love looking at the regional geology as a, as a as a key to to how and why things happen in a basin like this. Let's let's look at this map. It looks fairly mundane, but it's actually super important. These are paleo shorelines through time, 80 million years red, and progressing through. Uh, uh, outbuilding of the shoreline shelf margin at the end of the campanian which is the age of the section that we're, we're focused on in, in our projects 73 million years so seven million years of outbuilding captured on this map you can see the progress that the shoreline made through time with each advancing uh, colored uh, surface now what's going on here though we've got this we got continuous progradation, continuous progradation, and all of these shorelines start converging back into this area, and nothing happens for millions of years, or apparently nothing happens as far as shoreline progradation. Well, what's happening during that time is there, there's, there's all kinds of things happening out here. The Theta West fan is fed by a, an extended period of stalled progradation. Effectively, the sediments that are coming into the basin that are, that are outbuilding the shelf margin here are simply bypassing this very steep margin here and depositing into the deep basin. That's what gives us this extraordinary fan system, an extended period of shelf margin bypass and deposition into the basin floor. Importantly, deposition in the basin floor directly on top of the HRZ source rock. Extraordinary, by any major measure, extraordinary. We've spoken a lot about Theta West Fan. How did we find it? How did we, how did we convolve all the, the knowledge and the technology that we have uh, available to us to translate a seismic panel that looks like this into a well that looks like that. Well, it's, it, it's amazing. What we found is truly amazing. The Theta West fan, while we thought it was going to be good, it's spectacular. Let's look at the reservoir interval in Theta West in a bit more detail to give you a better understanding of what these things look like in as much detail as we have. The Formation Microimaging Tool, FMI, is a tool that records bed thicknesses in, in, at a level resolution about the thickness of your finger. So this tool is run throughout the entirety of the, of, of the Talitha well. We've recorded this interval of the Theta West fan uh, and, and we're looking at that today. Uh, sandstones are the cleanest sandstones are the brightest colors, brightest yellows and whites. You get higher clay content, you get darker colors. Some of the very, very thin strips in here have higher clay content. Importantly, this entire section has still high net to gross. Maybe more importantly, and definitely more importantly, it's oil charged. We look at a, a smaller interval, a 20-foot interval, a thinner interval on the FMI. 
you can see that the the nature of the bedding in more detail. You see the individual sandstone uh, uh, strata here recorded by the FMI with thin, uh, uh, higher clay content uh, beds between them. This is a, a fantastic picture, nearly like whole core, looking at, at rocks on the surface in detail. This is, gives us an understanding of what the reservoirs are, are like in the subsurface and, and how we want to approach drilling and completing and producing in them. This is an extraordinary outcome for us. Again, the Theta West fan is, is the largest new play uh, on the North Slope, not just largest in physical scale, it's, it's largest in, in, in volume, in my opinion. So let's, uh, let's move on uh, to the next presenter. Uh, thank you for your time. Okay, um, thanks a lot, Ed. What we're going to do now is talk about the volumetrics for the Theta West complex. Um, first thing I want to point out is how we define that um, volumetric, how, you, how we define the container. And the way we do that is by mapping the upper surface here and the lower surface here. The volume is the, um, the thickness between these two intervals integrated over the entire uh, 3D area, or the entire fan area. Sorry, sorry. The other thing to point out here is that we can go almost 3,000 feet up dip from the Talitha A well here. You can follow along the Theta West reflector. You can go up to the upper fan complex. And up here, we're almost about 3,000 3, feet up dip from the Talitha A well. So I'll go on to the next slide. The question then becomes, um, how, uh, how do we define the aerial extent of this fan complex? We can measure the volume now. How big is it aerially? And to do that, we look at our um, petrophysical processing here, pet, uh, seismic petrophysics, we call it. Here, the data is processed in the um, offset domain. So in other words, what we do is identify characteristics of the seismic uh, attribute that are indicative of hydrocarbons. So we're just going to call this our hydrocarbon stack, hydrocarbon indicator stack. And what we're looking for is this red color. And this red color tells us a section of rock that's indicative of both reservoir quality sand, but also uh, the presence of light hydrocarbons. So we can see that as we move up dip from the Talitha well, that response in Theta West is very robust and continuous all the way up dip. We also see the um, response in the upper fan. And we're showing a provisional uh, location for the Theta West number one well. We haven't landed on that uh, yet. We're still discussing it but we will be um, obviously designing that to test both the upper and lower fan in areas where we see the favorable hydrocarbon response. So, that deter so what we do is um, at every point in the survey, we extract the value of the uh, Theta West reflector. You can see there in the red. All right, so now we're showing the hydrocarbon indicator extract in, an, in um, the uh, Pantheon leasehold. You can see that here that this red color, this is corresponding to the seismic line we just saw. This is, uh, these are areas that we think um, are hydrocarbon saturated. Um, and so we've outlined that with that with this solid blue polygon. That's our Theta West lower, most likely case. And just a word about this area down here. This is an area where there was no seismic acquired. So of course we can't show the hydrocarbon indicator attribute there. But uh, we see that it's surrounded on three sides by uh, um, a robust hydrocarbon response. We believe it's there. And also the uh, depositional setting there is just exactly the same as the surrounding area. So we believe that this area is highly prospective. And in fact, we um, acquired that acreage in the January lease sale. The um, one other thing to point out is this dashed or dotted line here in the north. That is the um, Theta West upper fan complex overlaying for reference. So um, we'll see that in just a minute. So moving on to the next slide, here it is. There's the dotted line. And then you can see the um, polygon for Theta West lower and Theta West upper. And this is the Theta West upper fan is um, also very strong response. And it um, also exhibits a, a geometry that you might expect from um, a submarine fan being shut off a shelf to the west. 
So let's move on and look at the volumetrics. We uh, take inputs from Theta West, uh, sorry, the Talitha well, but also the gross rock volume. And we run this through simulations, 2000 trials in this case, in a Monte Carlo analysis. And we get a P50 or a median case oil in place of 12.7 billion barrels. And 11 billion of that is net to um, Pantheon. And recoverable reserves, we um, are using an input um, distribution of recovery factors. We get 1.2 billion barrels net to Pantheon. And in the middle uh, panel, this is just a list of sensitivities, the sensitive inputs, and the, the greatest sensitivity, as I said at the top there, is the gross rock volume. So we'll move on to the upper fan. It's the same analysis, only here. The only difference here is that instead of a uh, mapped upper and lower surface, we're using a slab distribution as an input um, because it doesn't have as widely varying uh, thickness as the lower fan complex. And so in this case, we get a P50 or median value of 1.29 billion barrels in place, of which 1.1 billion would be in Pantheon acreage. And we get a P50 recoverable of 210 million barrels uh, in Pantheon acreage. So adding those up, just to summarize, uh, we have in the Theta West fan complex, a gross of 14 billion barrels, of which 12.1 would be in Pantheon acreage. And in terms of recoverable, 1.41 billion barrels in Pantheon acreage. So uh, just to take away some points on Theta West, this is a really exciting uh, project. This is one of the larger projects we've seen in onshore in a long time. Um, it, the the uh, polygon that encloses both the upper and lower is shown here in, in different colors. And that polygon is 18 times larger than Tarn. Uh, we estimate Tarn's EUR to be about 150 million barrels. So we can also say that this uh, project is well-defined by proprietary 3D and that we can go 2,000 to 3,000 feet up dip to pay in the same interval in the Talitha A well. And as we go up dip, um, not only do we expect improved reservoir character, but we also are seeing from the seismic that it's going to be 50 to 100% thicker, depending on where you are as you go up dip. The seismic attribute analysis that we use to define this um, feature, um, we could say it worked at Talitha A. We saw um, an a, a improved response in Talitha A relative to pipeline and um, that response correctly predicted hydrocarbons in um, Theta West at Talitha A. So we're very confident going further up to, to the Northwest that this will be um, successful. And uh, the added bonus here is we're only five to 20 miles west of the Dalton Highway. So you look down and there's the highway, the closest point would be about there. There were only about 5.5 miles west of that. And as the project is developed, we can move up um, and expand. So that's uh, 12 billion barrels oil in place net to Pantheon. Let's turn it over to Roger to discuss the shelf margin deltaic sequence. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, this slide you've seen before, this is the SMD, SMD section in Talitha. I brought this up again just to, to impress you that we have gained an awful lot of information from the rocks at, with the core, with what Mike Smith gave us. And with that information, that knowledge, we can transfer it to the other wells in the area. For example, let's go to Alcade. As you know, Alcade has a tested zone right here. We tested six feet in this zone here. And as you know, we have oil all the way down to, to the TD of the well and continues on going most likely but you don't know what's going on above it. This is the SMDB, SMDB section. With the knowledge we gained from Talitha, we now know that that section in Alcade is also filled with oil. So let's zoom in on, on that a little bit and look at what's called the FMI tool, the Formation Micro Scanner or Imaging Tool. It's much higher resolution than the regular logs are that we do the log analysis with. It just gives us an image of what's going on. When it's brown, we're looking at shales. This is the interface 
between the K10 shale and the SMD B section. When it turns yellow, that is sand filled with oil. So what I'm gonna do now is page down and we'll look at the FMI at numerous locations. We drop down a little bit, we're down into the best zone or a better zone at least anyway of the section and what you're seeing is it's filled with oil. Very high net to gross sand to shale. Continuing on, it gets a little bit shalier, but still high net to gross. A little bit shalier in this section. Now we're getting to some, some uh, thicker sands, but still maybe 50% net to gross. Get a little bit further and we get to a zone that's really quite shaly and likely separating the SMDB section from Alcade. Getting a little bit sandier as we continue down, sandier again, get into the Alcade zone and we're getting very sandy. And again, all filled with oil. And continuing down all the way to the bottom, you can see how it just varies in net to gross. So there's a outline of all 12 sections that I've pulled out of the FMI. So you can see the tremendous variability that exists in this section. The next question becomes, okay, with all that information we have, the SMD now also being in Alcade, we know it's in Talitha, we had it in Pipeline before. How does that all fit together? How do we map that together? So we've designed an attribute from the seismic that will highlight the SMDB rock and show where it is the best. It's not tied to any of these wells, it's simply an attribute. And that attribute is shown there in the map that you see. Right here is the pipeline well location, and that's the pipeline well, 500 feet of SMD pay. The Talitha well location is right here on the edge. Alcade is over here. Merak and Alcor are here. All these zones have oil in them. And this attribute fits perfectly all five wells. So now we can get a really good, confident understanding of what the outline is of the SMD B section. Just to contrast, prior to gaining all this knowledge from the Talitha well, Talitha, excuse me, Talitha A well, we thought the SMD B section looked like that. So let me point out some landmarks. There's pipeline, here's Talitha, there's Alcade. So that's what we thought was going on. But what we know now is it really looks like that. Pipeline, Talitha, Alcade, and Alcorn Merak. And really nice is here is the road and the pipeline. We can produce this reservoir from numerous locations on the road, and the reservoir has gained in size and quality. So this is a really exciting project. Jerry will show us the volumetrics now. All right, thanks, Roger. Uh, we'll walk through this in uh, the similar way that we did for Theta West. It's the same procedure. So what you're looking at here is the same map Roger just showed. It's just a, a different color scale, just to highlight the dynamic range a little bit. And uh, a couple of the features you can see on this are um, Thick, a much thicker um, and more res robust response off to the southwest. But we do know that there's pay up in here with this sort of a little bit more modeled look here up at Alcade. So we, now we can see that we have um, a response trending all the way from pipeline, wrapping around what we call the funnel, and then up into Alcade. And so we're going to define the most likely case as the polygon you're looking there, at, looking at in blue. And we're going to constrain that to a, a hundred foot isopack, and you can't see that very well, but that's this line right here. So we, we want to be um, um, calculate volumes for areas where the isopack is greater than 100 feet. So we're going to look at the same kind of a, an analysis that we looked at before. This is a Monte Carlo sim simulation. In this case, the 10,000 trials. Um, so here we calculate a P50 or median volume of 2.77 billion barrels of which 2.66 are net to polygon. So we can control 96% of this project. So we have almost all of it. 
Uh, in terms of recoverable resources, we're at about 400 million barrels net to uh, Pantheon. All right, now I'll turn it over to Jay. He's going to talk about the uh, development of these two projects. Thank you, Jerry. Well, now I'll talk about monetizing the assets. As we've, as we've heard, and as I've talked about and everyone else, location is key. These are drainage areas along the Dalton Highway. We will put development pads along the Dalton Highway. We'll simply put down gravel in the disturbed area. We can work 24-7, 365 days a year prior to getting a full field development plan as long as we are within that disturbed area along the highway and we can develop about 200 million barrels in that manner. That is a huge oil field in its own right. Now, on to some full field development economics. This is simply a matrix showing the net present values in gross and in per barrel terms in various oil prices. I don't need to read them off to you there. A&S crude sells at about the equivalent of Brent. As you've heard from Mike, our, our crude is between mid 30s to low 40s API. It's very sweet. We believe we will get a premium to the normal TAPS crude price. You can put in your own Brent crude price, but at, a, at $60, the combination is about $3 billion net present value to Pantheon. And remember, we have 100% of this project. So before we go into showing the, uh, the video and then to the Q&A. We are gonna do this environmentally with no emissions. We are simply going to produce the product. We're gonna burn the gas to produce electricity. We will do that both in our development scheme and, and in our production scheme. We will re-inject the CO2, we will re-inject the water, and we will produce the oil either into directly into taps or in the early stages truck it up to pump station one we call this green energy alaska green oil alaska so back over to you jerry for the video all right let me launch the video and while jerry's launching the video i just uh, just wanted to say that we we made the video because we, we, we recognize we've, you know, we've, we've presented a lot of technical information. And, and as Jay started the, the state at the very beginning, uh, I th trying to see it, you know, if you're not an experienced technical person, trying to understand it and visualize it's very difficult. Um, we're hoping that this video will, will clarify it for, for the non-technical audience and kind of give you a picture of what's going on in the subsurface. All right, we'll start with the surface view. You've all seen this before, so we don't need to talk about that. What we're going to do is rotate this up and look at the subsurface, and we'll make a few points before we start showing you the layers. So first, we're going to start with the pipeline well. This is kind of the um, driving force that um, is responsible for a lot of what we've seen uh, I have presented to you so far. A lot of the results of our work program originated with this idea. We um, are showing here the oil saturation curve. That's in green here. It's uh, presented as a lathe. So you can think of this as a, a, a lathe to kind of display where the larger diameters in green indicate higher oil saturations. At Pipeline, uh, due to various technical issues, we believe that the um, log was not, uh, the well was not properly evaluated. We went back in and reevaluated it and saw that there was about 2,700 feet of oil saturated column in this log, bounded in this well, bounded mainly by the uh, K10 on the top and the Kaparic at the base. So we went out and uh, acquired <clears throat> about 1,000 kilometers of 3D seismic data at excellent quality. We tie in the uh, pipeline well to that data volume, and you can see that uh, we're going up dip from oil-saturated rocks as we go to the northwest. 
And now we'll replace that with the same line, but this time process for hydrocarbon indicators. Again, the red meaning uh, better hydrocarbon indications. And we see those increasing, uh, going up dip again from the pipeline well. And so from this data set, we're able to extract surfaces so we can map the geometry of all the relevant surfaces in the area. And now we're gonna look at the Talitha well. So we've rotated around, here's pipeline. The Talitha well was drilled right about on this location, just to the down dip edge of the Theta West, both in terms of um, structural dip, but also in the seismic response. And Talitha is shown here. And Talitha confirmed our uh, prediction based on seismic attributes. We saw uh, oil saturation throughout the Talitha column, as Mike Smith showed you, 400 and over 400 samples, uh, all oil saturation saturated in the K10 to Kapara interval. So what we're going to do now is um, start layering from the bottom up, starting with the Kapara, so you can see in 3D what these horizons look like. So this first one here is the Kaparic. And this is the regional sur Kaparic surface. And the color scale we're using, lighter colors up here mean shallower, blacker, darker colors mean deeper. So it's uh, gently dipping off to the southeast. We extract the, uh, the uh, hydrocarbon indicator response. It's shown here just underneath um, the Kaparic surface. So we'll make that transparent so we can see it better. And now you can see the uh, hydrocarbon response defines the outline of the Kaparic Reservoir, so that the reds and oranges are the best responses. And you can see that type, uh, Talitha and Pipeline were drilled in similar responses in the Kaparic, and both had oil in the Kaparic. And then we'll turn these uh, reservoirs green, and we'll refer to them as geobodies. After, um, Shortly after the uh, deposition of the Kaparic, or just about right on top of the Kaparic actually, is the HRZ. Uh, as Ed mentioned, this is the regional source rocks. It's a very important um, horizon for our analysis. We're going to rotate that up and look at that in map view. All right, uh, this map is showing um, HRZ maturity, and, and by that we mean generally the capability of the source rock to generate oil. Um, up in the north in the blue colors, the, the uh, HRZ is immature, meaning that um, it was, wasn't capable of generating hydrocarbons. And on the south, buried too deeply, and it's in the gas generated phase. The uh, peak oil saturation of generation was down in this fairway, right underlying the uh, Pantheon leasehold. And that's not coincidental. We acquired the leases to be on the main oil producing fairway, but also near the Dalton Highway. All right, now we'll continue on back to our 3D view, and we'll move up into Theta West. So in this view, we see the uh, base of the Theta West fan complex. So in other words, this is what the seafloor topography approximately looked like at the time the Theta West fan complex was underway, the deposition was underway. And what we're seeing here, um, it, red is shallower water, blue is deeper water, and uh, what we're seeing is about 40 million years after the HRZ, by that time, the continental shelf margin had advanced almost into the western part of our acreage. And shortly afterwards, um, this is the top of the Theta West fan complex. In a relatively brief, brief period of time, you can see much less slope here. The, uh, the Theta West fan complex, or the depth sedimentation from the Theta West fan of the Theta West fan complex resulted essentially in this basin being almost planed off. And so we're going to now peak in between these two layers. And there we'll see the um, hydrocarbon indicator body for the Theta West the fan complex. We'll make that transparent. And this shows the uh, outline of the Theta West lower fan complex where we see the uh, positive hydrocarbon indicators. And the proposed location will lie somewhere within this disk. All right, and then moving up from Theta West, lower, we saw a period of uh, shale deposition, deep water uh, 
organic shale, a uh, good seal, the hue shale, and following that, the Theta West upper fan was deposited. And then um, relatively rapid, rapidly uh, came the alkane shelf margin. So in a relatively short period of time, the, elk, the shelf margin advanced all the way to the alkane area, the eastern part of our acreage. And so we'll pause here just to rotate this around so you can see in three dimensions what these um, Theta West and Kapark reservoirs look like, how they relate in time. And in particular, you can see how thick, just how massive that Theta West lower reservoir is. So now we'll uh, stop here and just point out the faults um, associated with the Theta West, with the Alcade Reservoir. These, this um, yellow fault uh, forms the uh, northwestern boundary of the, Theta, of the Alcade Reservoir, and this pink fault uh, divides the reservoir complex into two fault blocks. So we'll strip off the alkane shelf, or we'll make it a little more transparent so that we can see the faults and the geobody below it. And now we're going to rotate this around and take a look at the complex from the back. And we'll have a look at what the LK 2H well would be designed to do. So bear with us. This will take us a few seconds to get here. Okay, so what we're looking at now, this is the back wall or the fault bounded northwesterly surface of the um, Alcade geobody, the Alcade reservoir. And you can see these red uh, gold responses are indicative of high uh, hydrocarbon saturations. That response was tested by the um, Alcade well, the Alcade one well number one, and it was successful. So we're going to try and test the same anomaly a little bit further to the left there with the Alcade 2H. So we'll zoom in on that a little bit. And we're going to make it um, transparent in a second. First, I'll just show you the Alcade oil saturation. So it's again that late display, larger direct diameter, it's mean higher oil saturations. And the Alcade 2H well will be drilled from the highway near the Alcor load surface location. We'll come down into the Alcade Reservoir and then go horizontal towards the Alcade well, and you can see that well bore in the reservoir there. And we'll just twirl around to get to some more perspective on that. Okay, what we're going to do next is we're going to replace that geobody with um, an oil saturation geobody. This was um, created by projecting the oil saturations at the Alcade number one well, so not a lot of data to go on, but it gives you an idea of what we're trying to do here. So we'll turn this around a little bit. And we should make the point uh, before we go on here, that disk that you see is um, the completion at Alcade number one. So that's a six foot interval there that produced, um, flowed at 100 barrels per day. So what we're going to do now is drill horizontal wells through the oil saturation zone. You can see here by the green cells. We're going to penetrate that zone with the horizontal well bore. That well bore will be uh, on the order of 7,000 feet of horizontal section, plus or minus. Um, it'll have 30 stages as opposed to the one six-foot hole here. And there's not going to be just one. There'll be 44 of these well bores at Alcade. Each one of them should be capable of producing two and a quarter million barrels per well. So we'll zoom back now to get our uh, northwesterly view. And we'll make the Alcade shelf opaque again. And we'll conclude with the uh, SMDB. So following the Alcade shelf was the uh, K10. This marks near the top of the SMD reservoir, and, and we've mentioned the super trap before, if you remember that. That's this area here. You can see it right between the Alcade shelf here and the uh, K10 shelf uh, margin above it. So now we'll show the uh, SMD. We'll layer that on here, and we'll rotate into um, a little bit easier angle to view this. And you can see um, well-developed amplitude anomalies on the southwest side and extending all the way over into Alcade, a little bit thinner on that side than it is on the southwest. 
all of this, the entire uh, complex of five reservoirs was uh, then blanketed by the Decker D regional seal. So we'll, now we'll strip that off and show all the geobodies in space. Those are the Brooking ones, and now the complete section down to the Kaparic. I put our leasehold on here so that you can see that we control most of this by volume, and we're going to rotate this up and around so you can kind of see a perspective as we rotate around uh, how these all look, how they relate in space and thickness. And I'll just stop here just to uh, name these again. Uh, so starting at the bottom, the Kaparic, Theta West Lower, Theta West Upper, Alcade and SMDB, and in this view, you can really see the massive scale of the Theta West Lower Reservoir. It's just huge. It's thick and it's extensive. And now we'll swivel around and look at this in map view. And what we can see from this, it looks like if you were just talking about term in terms of surface area, we'd have about 76% of the oil in place of these five reservoirs. But um, the more accurate way of doing this is by gross rock volume. And in that sense, we have 89% of the oil in place of these five reservoirs. So that conclu concludes the video. I hope that helped. And thanks for watching. I'd just like to, I'd just like to add something at this point. Uh, you've got there, you, what you're seeing there is all the stacked reservoirs, one on top of the other. And again, you know, point out that to the northeast is Prudhoe Bay, uh, to the, the, the next kind of green blob up there to the northwest is Kaparic. Kaparic is about 14 billion barrels of oil in place, Kaparic and West Sac. That area that we've just discussed today is over 16 billion barrels of oil in place. This is a incredibly dense you know, kind of resource uh, that we're looking at. It's comparable to the early discoveries that were made in the in the '60s, uh, back when the this the, the before you know when all the first discoveries were made. And so, I want you to keep that picture in your mind right here. What we're looking at is an incredible resource density right next to the Dalton Highway and Trans-Alaska Pipeline, uh, which, you know, it's, it is unique uh, for, uh, for the North Slope. Well, that, that's been great, guys. I mean, it really has. So we got a lot of questions in, so we've got a little bit of time to answer some questions. So, Justin, I think you're the, you're the Q&A master. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Um, and look, a big thank you to to everybody that spoke today. I think we had a fantastic, I think shareholders would appreciate, we've had a fantastic access to some very, very high level technical people, which is very rare um, for companies. It's our objective to really let people have a look under the hood, to believe in us, to believe in what we are telling you, to believe in that there's data behind um, what appears to be, you know, very, very large uh, projects for, 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 for Pantheon. So also a very big thank you to Mr. Darkon for curating a special list of questions. As always, they're long. Um, they've been coming in thick and fast. I've got over 120 questions in front of me. I won't go through all of them. Um, I'll do my best to pick the key ones out. I will pass questions out to who I think is the most appropriate person um, and in the interest of time, I'll whiz through any quick ones myself. Um, so sort of getting into it straight away, the first question that's come up is, you know, when will the webinar be available on the company website? Um, noting that last, the last webinar it took a few days. What I would say is that we have recorded these webinars live. Again, it's something very rare for companies to do. We do it because we wanted people to, to see the energy and to feel um, feel that energy and I guess the authenticity of the presentation 
Uh, and that's the reason that it took a few days to get them available. Um, you know, there's, there's been sound issues, there's background noise. Sometimes, because it has been live, there's people talking over each other. This time, we've done our very best to make it different, so we hope that they'll be available. We're aiming to have it available uh, tomorrow uh, onto the company website. Um, another question here, you know, assuming we had an optimal work program over this coming winter season, it, we've, talk, we've talked about Alcade, we've talked about going back and testing the Talitha well, which was already drilled last year, as we know, and of course the giant Theta West well. Um, first question over to you, Bob. What would your preferred drilling program be um, if we had the opportunity this, this season? I guess from the first question is, would it be possible if we had the funding in place to, to do all three of those projects? Or what, what's your thinking on that, Bob? So this winter, we are, you know, we, we're going to be focused on testing Talitha and drilling Theta West. So that, that, that would be the first, first wells that we drill. Uh, our preference would be to drill Alcade, not as a winter well, but uh, something that we can start in the spring mm -hmm. and get going next, next summer. So, yeah. you know, if we, ha if we were completely funded, test uh, uh, drill Theta West, test Talitha, and uh, then follow on with the Alcade well. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks, Bob. Of course, because drilling out of the winter season, it typically comes at a lower cost because you don't have to winterize the rig and do all those kinds of things. Correct. Um, yeah. Um, another question here. They're in no particular order, although I've tried to group them as best as possible. Uh, a quick question just on you know, how do we avoid confirmation bias uh, in, in our analysis? And I think Mike talked about that specific point in, er, earlier on where they do their VAS completely independent of the data from the company. In fact, they specifically did not want any data on the well from the company. And likewise, in any group setting, every natural resource company in the world, in fact, every company in the world trying to prove something faces the same issues. We try and have a disparate group of people to challenge each other, to debate concepts, and we support that by consultants and independent experts uh, where we can. Uh, another random question here. Have all uh, members of the Pantheon executive team uh, vaccinated, been vaccinated against COVID? The answer is, to my understanding, yes, everybody has. So the next question concerns the decision uh, this week regarding uh, Conoco's Willow project. Um, and the question specifically is whether or not we have any, or we, we expect to, have, to face the same issues that Willow has and the other implications for Pantheon. Jay, what are your thoughts on that? Well, well, the big difference, as you can see on this map, is that Willow is on federal acreage in the NPRA. We're on state lands. Um, and so that, that's, that's the, the, the biggest difference. We will need to get a permit to put gravel down. Uh, that's, that's a given. Uh, we don't see that as a, uh, a big issue. Uh, our path to first oil is pretty clear. Uh, and dealing with the state as opposed to the feds it makes a huge, huge difference. Yeah, and I guess, Jay, of course, being, again, the same point, location, location, Lo location. Location, location, being... location, yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you for that, Jay. Um, look, while we're on it, the, the other question is concerning farm out and funding for Pantheon. This is a question that comes up a lot, and we're happy to answer it. Um, you know, where is Pantheon's status on that at this point in time? And the answer is precisely what we said in our stock exchange announcement of last week, and that is that we're running a farm out process. We do need to complete a farm out or to otherwise fund the company to have any activity this winter season. That's our objective. We're working towards it. It's always been the objective, and we're very, very confident that we'll get to that point. Um, noting last year we didn't do a farm out, we ended up equity funding it. We made that we made that equity funding transaction in late November, so we do have time. Um, we just want to write, find the right partner. You know, getting a getting in um, with a farm out is a you know it's an involved process. It takes time for them to understand and to do their their DD. It is like a marriage. We've got to make sure that we share the same um, objectives in terms of development and and so on with the project. So it's it's important for us, and and that I guess includes us taking a view on that company's other activities elsewhere as well. So it's not as simple as just 
chasing the checkbook. It's about finding the partner uh, that makes sense. But look, right now we're we're focusing on that. It's the summer break. We'll, we've we've got time on our side, thankfully. So we'll make a decision uh, going forward in terms of what we think is the right decision for the company. Um, the next question here actually leads off that. It specifically is how critical is it to find the right partner that understands Pantheon's plays? I, I think I just touched upon that. Um, look, again, money is what, or capital is one part of the equation, finding a partner. The other, of course, is what that part, party brings to the table, be it skill set um, or other form of resource. And you know, we'll consider that if a company doesn't, if a company comes in that doesn't have that skill set, we have the ability to access that skill set through uh, third third party independent um, contractors. There's a question here on noting that Santos had made a bid for oil search. Um, and does that is there any see through implications for the for, for valuations and so on? I think the answer to that one, if I can just take that one on is we can't speak for Santos. We know that oil search has two major assets, one of course in PNG. They have some more mature assets which are producing and and of course, they're Alaskan assets. What we do know, of course, is that Santos would have run the slide rule across Alaska. They're better funded, uh, so we think it's a net positive for the area. Um, moving forward onto Talitha A, question for you, Bob, and that is that we've never ascribed probabilities of success uh, or out on, on outcomes for the world for each particular zone. I know you have views on this, Bob. Is that something that you want to talk about? Um, I. I... Well, Talith A, I, I, the way I would put it is we've drilled it and, uh, uh, and you know, we have found hydrocarbons in the, in the zones that, that we've described uh, today. You know, we've got hydrocarbons in uh, the Theta West fan, uh, the upper part of the Theta West fan, the, you know, shelf margin delta and the two lobes in, uh, uh, that are in the slope system. So you know, how those, you know, how those individual wells will perform, uh, we'll find out uh, yeah. when they're tested. Yeah. Just stay there, Bob, another quick question. Um, and, and that is that the guys have spoken earlier in this presentation about our contingent resource, about 1.4 billion barrels of, uh, of, of recoverable contingent resource um, in Theta West, but we've based those on primary recovery only. Um, why have we not considered, or why have we not included, or have we not considered secondary or tertiary recovery, recovery methods? Can you give us some comment on that? Um, I think we're trying to be conservative. The, the numbers we're putting out there are numbers that we think are completely justifiable. Um, and you know, as you, you as you can see, you know, we're we're, we're not using high uh, recovery factors um, and that gives us considerable up, upside. Yeah. Uh, so that's why we've done it. Okay. So it's not that secondary and tertiary recovery methods are not applicable. You've just taken a conservative approach and elected okay. not to use those at this point in time. Correct. Okay. okay great. Um, Jay, a question for you, if I may. Um, this is about using independent experts. We previously had used the experts at Lee Keeling to do some work on us for Alcade. Uh, and also uh, the, the Kaparic. Uh, the question is, would we consider using those for Theta West and for Talitha? Well, yes, I, we, we will. And, it, and I think at some point in the future, we will bring in uh, um, independent experts. Um, we haven't done that to date. Uh, I'd like to have one more well uh, in Theta West. I'd love to have more testing data on the Talitha A well uh, before we mm -hmm. would do that. So uh, I think that would be the appropriate time to um, bring in independent experts. And we'll make a decision yeah. at that this, time uh, as to who, who would be the best. Yeah, I understood. Um, a question for you again, Bob, if I may. And we saw it briefly on the 3D video that, that Jerry uh, just showed, and that is this huge expanding um, thick section moving from Talitha towards Theta West. How far does the Theta West ex target extend from from Talitha, and how does that compare, you know, on a relative measure to other projects you've seen? 
Well, I think it, for the North Slope, this is unique. Uh, I think I think Ed described it perfectly. You know, it's a hundred thousand acres of a huge, thick, you know, confined basin floor fan. Uh, you know, six hundred feet at Talitha, thirteen hundred feet to thick uh, at our proposed location. I mean, it's a, it's a, a it is enormous. I mean, you know, I, I have yet to see anything comparable described on the North Slope like this. And what it's comparable to is, you know, things that if people have seen in deep water uh, plays uh, in different parts of the world. So, I, I mean, this is, you know, a, you know, a deep water, you know, fan play that we can uh, drill and develop onshore. Okay, yep. Thank you, Bob. Um, question here is, how deep would your proposed Theta West well terminate, and will that also extend to the Kaparic? Uh No, what we plan to do is drill the upper part of the uh, Theta West, so we do the upper lobe and drill through the base of the, the, of the lower lobe. Yeah. So well, that's it. Understood. And with VAS, we had Mike Smith earlier on, um, with it being so successful in its analysis at Talitha, is that something that we intend to use in future wells? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. And a question for Ed, if I may. Um, Ed was speaking about the tarn field earlier. Um, I have a question here talking about the similarities and differences between the basin floor fan and the tar the tarn field. We've referred to them previously as an analog. Thank you for the question. Uh, with regard to similarities and differences between the basin floor fan and the tarn field, uh, I can I can tell you that from a depositional process perspective, they're very similar. It's really scale that's the primary difference. In addition to age. We can't forget that. Tarn is Cinemanian age. Its reservoirs have a lot of volcanoclastic debris, and the diagenetic products or the chemically changed products of those volcanic volcanoclastics actually are quite detrimental to overall reservoir quality at Tarn. Campanian sandstones, as we talked about earlier in the presentation, do not have uh, volcanoclastics or significant amount of volcanoclastics in them. That's a very big positive for Theta West and in, in our projects in general. But from a process perspective, Tarn is a, a, a lower slope apron basin floor fan complex, similar to what we expect to see at Theta West. Uh, but probably the, 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 the upper lobe of Theta West would be a very good direct analog with, with Tarn from a process perspective. The lower lobe is so much larger and thicker that it, it's, it's Tarn times 20. And uh, but but from a process perspective, FACES architecture perspective, I think we're going to see something similar to that, just many 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 times larger. Thanks, Ed. While I have you hang around, I have another question. Um, it concerns Alcade Number One Well, which was originally drilled, as we know. Can you please just briefly explain why that well didn't reach its intended target depth, i.e., why the drilling was pre was 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 concluded prematurely? The question about Alcade is, is an important one. Uh, we plan to drill Alcade through the Kaparic. We were encouraged by what we saw in the Kaparic at Alcor and Merak. It was thin, but oil bearing. We wanted to test the Kaparic a little more uh, basinward, uh, hopefully picking up a thicker section. We realized that there was Kaparic with oil in it in the Sequoia well and uh, oil in the Kaparic in pipeline as well. So the, the plan was to drill through the Kaparic. In late February, uh, remember it's very, very cold in Alaska at that time. It, it's hard to believe that there could be flowing water on the surface, but in late February, the Sag River, which was just to our east, experienced what's called an off-ice event, where the, the normally thin rind of ice across the flowing uh, river uh, below it, flowing north, uh, froze to bottom uh, just to the north of our location, uh, just opposite the Alcor well that we drilled in 2012. That, that freeze to bottom caused a temporary damming 
of water flow to the north and, and forced at an inflation of the ice sheet that covered the flowing water uh, that eventually ruptured. Uh, that rupture started fairly passively, uh, obviously a big concern for us, but the, the Dalton Highway is, is really built on a major man-made uh, gravel berm, uh, effectively a dam. So we were confident that, that uh, we were gonna be in okay shape, but the off-ice uh, uh, event evolved into a full-on breach of the Sag uh, River bank and across the tundra and actually cut the Dalton Highway a couple of miles north of, of our uh, Alcade location. That cutting of the highway effectively severed our ability to resupply the rig uh, and created a, uh, not just an operational uh, challenge that was extreme, but it created a serious safety challenge for us. We knew at the time that, that the breach of the highway started that we were gonna have to wind up operations pretty quickly. And, and that's when we made the decision that we would get through the, the, the primary seismic anomaly target of interest, get as deep through that as we could, and then stop. In fact, we cut the seismic anomaly of interest uh, uh, right on depth, and we were still in oil when we TD'd the well at about 8,600 feet. So uh, it was an unfortunate circumstance, but, but uh, Mother Nature does that uh, to us from time to time. Importantly, since that off-ice condition, that was the only one ever recorded that actually uh, uh, cut across the highway. The, this, the state has improved the Dalton, raised its bed substantially, uh, and buttressed it against any further events like that uh, in the future. So that's not something that we genuinely need to, to worry about to an extreme degree uh, from this point forward. Mm. And, and what the, so it, at that point in time when, when drilling uh, operations were concluded, am I correct in understanding that we were in the middle of the pay zone at that point? Thanks for the question. Yes, uh, definitely. When drilling operations were concluded at Alcade, we were still in oil. Uh, we, we knew that from the, from the mud log cuttings at the time. We knew that from the gas chromatograph at the time. And we've used all of that type of information in, in, in the course of reevaluating Alcade uh, into its current state as we see it today. Uh, it, it, it is a very, uh, very thick oil column uh, from really from the K10 top seal all the way down to, to TD. And I, I, it's, a, uh, it, it's an extraordinary circumstance, not dissimilar actually from what, we're now, what we now have seen at Talitha. Uh, the, the petroleum system is so uh, proficient, it's so effective. Uh, and efficient that really, if you have porosity in this in this section sitting above the HRZ, it's very likely to be charged with light oil. Thank you. And Bob, you've spoken about this. You use these words "oil down to" uh, frequently. What does that mean, Bob, in terms of our estimates for Alcade? So Ed said that the well terminated in the oil section. Have we included anything from that depth below in any of our estimates? No, uh, we haven't. Uh, so we expect another three or 400 feet of section to be tested. Uh, we have no reason to believe that there will not be sands down there and will be hydrocarbon bearing. But we have not put those in in any of our estimates. Okay. Okay. So if we if we if and when we drill Alcade number two, how much deeper would that well uh, be drilled? So what we plan to do is first a, 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 do a vertical hole and collect data through the whole section. So get it down to the HRZ, not drill to uh, not drill to the Kaparic, but collect uh, data to through the, the whole section, um, and then uh, come back, kick off, and drill the horizontal uh, through the, the zones that we've already tested. Great, thanks, Bob. Now I have a question here for Mike, if he's if he's still uh, still available, uh, and that is on VAS. And and thank you, Mike, for the great um, the great slide presentation you gave us earlier on today. The question is, um, have you used VAS in other fields elsewhere, and how accurate how accurate um, is it in its assessment? 
Uh, yeah, we're working all over the world. Um, it's been uh, it's been very accurate. I'm not sure we have statistics yeah. on that, but um, uh, not just other places, but in non Pantheon wells in Alaska, uh, we've been able to, you know, our, our data kind of limits other companies' wireline logs, and um, you know, we we did a big exploration well for another company in the year before we did Talitha, and um, again we did a blind. We we picked all their main pay horizons. We uh, everything uh, when they did their final petroleum system analysis and overlaying our data on their seismic and everything was, you know, was spot on and stuff. So, yep, brilliant. Uh, okay, Mike. Well, thank you very much. That that was it. Was leading to the second question, which was whether or not you'd uh, looked at other wells in Alaska and you've answered that. So thank yeah, you so up, up on the slope and, and also in Cook Inlet and stuff. And um, So, yeah, and, uh, and we're doing a big study with the state on on their old wells that were drilled by the Navy in the 50s and stuff. So. Brilliant. And, and Mike, in terms of efficacy, and excuse, excuse me if this is a silly question, but, you know, you do lots of, this is your specialty, of course, was the the quality of the samples that you received out of this well? Do they enable you to get a get an accurate? I mean, were you happy with the efficacy of the work that you did based upon um, the quality of the sampling out of the Talitha well? Yeah, you know, um, one one thing is right. I, I mentioned this week we work on cuttings that are both two types of cuttings: cuttings that are sealed at the well and cuttings that are, are not sealed at the well. So the sealed at the well cuttings, within a minute of coming to the surface, uh, they're captured and, and loaded into tubes that we send up there and, and hermetically sealed, and then they come back and, um, you know, all that oil and gas that was in the cuttings when they got to the surface is still there, and we analyzed that. And that, those were done very well and give us a, a good shot at making some resource assessment in the and the quality of the oil and stuff. And then the other kind are the um, lab loaded and uh, and they have usually lost much of their oil and gas before they get analyzed then because they haven't been sealed up. But that's the data in that second column that we were talking about, uh, producibility or movability of the oil. So a good quality reservoir rock uh, will show, uh, you know, that's charged with oil we show quite a bit of oil in the field at the well sample, but the better the quality, the less oil you'll see in the lab loaded uh, because the oil will be, will be being lost and stuff. So, but these were uh, the guys uh, that caught these samples did a very good job. Uh, we have a philosophy besides of not wanting to know what everybody else knows. We also, one of the reasons this works is because our processes are very gentle. So we, we strive to keep the oil and gas in the rocks before uh, we try to extract it and stuff, as, as opposed to other cuttings analysis processes, which drive most of the oil and gas out of the rock before the analysis begins and stuff. Oh, fantastic. Look, thank you, Mike, very much. Well, I'm very, very conscious of time. Um, I've, I've, I've got one or two last questions, and then I think we can uh, you know, draw a line under the, the presentation for this evening. Um, one is about, back to this question of a farm out, that's just a question that just popped up. Uh, Jay, perhaps for you, the question is: Are we looking for a farm out for the whole, for the for all of the projects, or just for one project? Jay, could you comment on 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 where we're at on that? Yeah, well, well, the answer is yes and yes. Um, we've talked to people about farm outs on one specific project. We've talked to people about farm outs on two parts of of two projects, and we've talked to people about. The, the whole suite of our 160,000 acres. So the great thing about having 100% working interest is you can be totally flexible on what you do. And yeah. we're, we're totally flexible. And, you know, given the fact that yeah. we're, we're, we're in this to prove it and sell it like a, like a, a venture capitalist, like a private equity, uh, just gives us all, all kinds of flexibility to, uh, to make, make, the deal that you know fits with uh, the farm out partner if they're the right yeah. partner. Yeah. 
Thanks, Jay. I mean, another question here related is, what makes you think you can achieve a farm out this year if you couldn't achieve one last year? And I think what, you know, Jay, you and I have spoken about this many times. Last year was a different world for oil and gas companies. We were in COVID times. The oil price went to zero at one point, but was probably 30 to $35. You know, during the, during the time we would have been looking for a farm out partner. Today it's, you know, $65. We had uh, companies, oil companies, really looking inwardly at that point in time last year, fighting for survival, getting their own portfolios in line, certainly not looking for new projects. But the big one, of course, which we don't speak about, is Theta West. You know, last year during farm out discussions, there was no mention of Theta West because so much of that acreage we had to pick up in the lease sales, which occurred, of course, in January of this year. So last year in farm out discussions, there was no talk of Theta West. It was apples versus oranges, and uh, I think it's a, it's a really important point. So we're in a much better time and a place this year. doesn't guarantee anything but we're in a much better time and place. And, and Pantheon's, given the success of the results and what you've seen before us earlier today, the balance of probability has swung significantly in our favour in terms of our confidence in the project, the understanding of the project, and all leading towards um, you know, a, a greater chance of success in either achieving a farm out or otherwise funding the business. Um, I think that's probably about it for the key questions. Um, yeah, I just as, as as a closing point, perhaps Roger, we haven't heard from you in the Q and A, and you've turned to be a, the sort of the minor celebrity for Pantheon shareholders who've grown to love your style and your enthusiasm. Um, if I may, how has the project evolved from your perspective since we drilled the Talitha well? Has your understanding, or has your confidence, or has your concern, or you know, how how do you feel about the project we have now post drilling Talitha, perhaps before drilling Talitha? Uh, it, it just keeps on getting better. Now, like, like Jay said at the beginning, good projects get better. Well, from the exploration phase, it keeps on getting better. It's, uh, I've, I've, I've never seen anything like it. To be able to even say the words half a mile of oil, that's ridiculous. But it's, it's true. It's, yeah. it's, it's awesome. I've never seen anything like it. It is very, very exciting stuff. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, thanks uh, Roger. And Jay, look, perhaps leading off, finishing off with the CEO, one quick question that's come up, and you know, this is an unusual presentation in that it's highly technical, and it was intentionally highly technical to try and provide support for what we're saying. So we don't expect everybody to understand everything, but the information is there almost as a resource document. It's not a typical glossy investor presentation. That's not what it's intended to be. But the question that keeps coming up, because many investors are, are generalists and they don't have the specialist knowledge that everybody on this call may have, and they look across at, uh, in fact, I've got it on my screen here. They they, they look across at the um, at the at, at the willow field, you know, over uh, sorry the um, the horseshoe field over here, which Oil Search came into it and paid three dollars ten per barrel of contingent resource back at the tail end of 2017. And you know, based on Pantheon's assessment of its contingent resources, you know, we've got a tiny market cap, 350 million pounds, or about 500 million dollars. If you do the math, it works out to be you know, as you said, less than one tenth of that, Jay, less than 30 cents per barrel. What do we need to do to try and bridge that gap and perhaps get a, a better, a, a better um, confidence in our, to bring a better valuation into our resources, Jay? Is that one well or is it 100 wells that we need to drill? What do you think we need to do to bring well, the. Well, it's two the, things. The, 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 Sorry, Justin. This, this webinar, I think, does it. But uh, I think. The, the three operations that we are planning for this next season, going back in and testing all the zones at the Talitha A well. Well, we, you know, it's already drilled, so that's, that's a, a relatively inexpensive operation to get, to get all that data. Drilling the, the up dip Theta West, moving that eight miles or nine miles and 2,000 feet up dip and getting into that thicker section that, that everybody described. That, that we're that we see on seismic and the attribute analysis and all doing that testing that getting a test on that and then in the in the spring summer drilling along the Dalton highway putting the gravel pad down for a, a full pad development there and drilling that horizontal well in the alcade anomaly and putting that on stream in my opinion that gets us that gets us 90% of the way to, to that valuation. Okay, I have a question here which I'll 
pass in the direction of Bob. Um, and, and Bob, the question is, would you consider Pantheon to be an exploration play or has it advanced beyond that in your perspective? Oh, it's definitely advanced beyond that. Uh, we are at the appraisal and development stage. Uh, the, the, the last probably exploration well in my career was, uh, was uh, the Talif A well. All the other wells we're going to be drilling are uh, appraisal and development. So we've, we've eliminated the expiration risk. We found hydrocarbons and, and we're, we've, we're well beyond uh, the expiration stage. And Bob, what does that mean in terms of both risk of the project, but also confidence or probability of success, if you like, in terms of um, developing or commercializing these fields? Well, I, I, again, it is, you know, we're, we're at a much lower risk profile than we were uh, two years ago and even where we were from uh, the fall. So we are at, you know, 60, 70 percent confidence of success. Fantastic. Jay, a quick question for you, if I may, and back onto this topic of location, a very specific question here, and that is, how important is Pantheon's location in terms of commercialization, both compared to Alaskan projects, but also perhaps compared to other projects internationally? Well, I, I don't think we could, you know, say it enough. I mean, we're we're right next to the Trans Alaska Pipeline, which is running below, a, you know, a third of capacity. We're right next to the, you know, the, the Dalton Highway, which carries all the equipment up to the North Slope. Um, you, you know, we're onshore. Uh, we're, we're not in a terribly environmentally sensitive area. I mean, if you're talking offshore. Um, in deep water, you have you know, much greater um, logistical issues than we have. It just makes all the difference in the world to be that close to your infrastructure. It makes everything much simpler and, right. and, Thank and you, easier and, and less expensive. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Bob, one question for you, if I may. Um, if the company's resource estimates are proven to be correct, how significant is this play relative to other plays, both onshore and offshore? Well, it's just, it will be as big as anything uh, anybody's found uh, in the world in uh, a, a long time. It's uh, 16 billion barrels of oil in place is world class, whether you find it in deep water West Africa or deep water uh, Guyana. I mean, this is this is this is a world class uh, resource, and the resource density, as I probably mentioned earlier, the resource density is comparable to the original discoveries that were made in the late '60s by uh, you know Prudhoe Bay and Kaparik. I mean, it's it's massive. Yeah. Okay. Look, well, great. Thank you, Jay, and. Thank you, everybody, today for your contribution to the webinar. Uh, very conscious of time. It has gone on uh, considerably. So, look, thank you all, um, in particular our special guests. Thank you for taking your time out to present um, um, for our shareholders, who I know uh, greatly appreciate it. Thank you to Mr Darkon again for his contribution as, as Chief Curator of Questions. Um, and I think that's, that's us over and out for now. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone.